There are more than seven million Boy Scouts in the world today and over four million Girl Guides. This great movement was founded by Lord Baden-Powell of Gilwell. How did it all begin? In Baden-Powell's own voice and words and illustrated by his own sketches, it started in 1908, but the microbe of scouting had got me long before that. When I was a boy at Charterhouse, I got a lot of fun out of trapping rabbits in woods that were out of bounds. In doing this, I learnt to creep silently, to note tracks and read their meaning, to use dry dead wood off trees and not off the ground for my fire and to avoid prowling masters. I shinned up the nearest ivy-clad tree, where I could nestle unobserved above the line of sight of the average searcher. During the school holidays, he went sailing and tramping with his elder brothers, activities which further developed his instinctive talent for scouting. This early photo of him shows him as a member of the Charterhouse Cadet Corps, with no strong ideas about a career, except a vague desire to travel, he sat at the age of 19 for the army entrance examination. In spite of an only average academic record, he was brilliantly successful. So much so that he was immediately commissioned as a sub-lieutenant in the 13th Hussars and sent to join the regiment in India at the end of 1876. In 1884, the regiment left India and on the way home landed in Natal because trouble with the Boers was threatening. baden Pearl, now a captain, was sent by his CO to find an unguarded route across the Drakensberg Mountains. He grew a beard and set out, leading a second horse to carry his supplies. Posing as a newspaper man, he got the required information without arousing suspicion. This was the first of his many adventures as a scout. Returning to Natal in 1888, he took part in the campaign against Dinizulu. This is his sketch of the rocky stronghold to which the rebellious native chief retired before surrendering. From Dinizulu, he took these beads, which now provide the pattern for the scouter's wood badge. This photograph shows him on a hunting trip in Swaziland, where he went in 1889 as secretary of a commission to settle the conflicting interests of British and Boer settlers. He had more adventures as a scout during his two years as intelligence officer for the Mediterranean. Once he posed as a butterfly hunter, and in this sketch he ingeniously recorded the positions of the guns in a fort. The guns were shown as markings on the lines of the butterfly. These lines crossed the one showing the shape of the fort and thus marked the position of the guns. In 1895, baden Pearl, now a major, was sent to the Gold Coast in West Africa to command a levy of African pioneers and scouts. The levy took part in the successful campaign to stop the blood sacrifices performed by the Ashantis. BP captured the bowl used to collect the blood, and it is now in the Royal United Service Museum in Whitehall. It was in the Ashanti expedition that he first saw the usefulness of the six-foot staff, not only as in this sketch for laying the field telegraph in the bush, but also for sounding swamps and taking measurements. It was on this same expedition that he first wore the cowboy hat. The Africans called him Kantankai, he of the big hat. Both the staff and the hat later became part of the Boy Scouts equipment. The Matabele Rebellion in 1896 found Major baden Pearl on active service again for what he afterwards called the best adventure of my life. Here he is watching a skirmish with Herbert Plumer, who also helped in the early days of the Boy Scouts and later became a field marshal. During this campaign, BP went alone on many scouting expeditions to find out the strength and disposition of the rebel forces. This is how he used to dress for such trips. 
Notice that as well as the hat, he's now wearing the scarf, which later became part of the Boy Scout uniform. He proved himself to be the outstanding scout of the British Army. One of his trophies from this campaign was the Kudu Horn, which was to play a part in the future. For his services in Matabele land, Major Baden-Powell, at the age of 40, was promoted colonel and then sent to Meerut in India to take command of the 5th Dragoon Guards. It was during this tour of duty that... I started teaching scouting to young soldiers in my regiment. In action, they carried out orders, but if their officer was shot, they were like a flock of sheep. I wanted each man to be an efficient, all-round, reliable individual. The scheme worked. The men loved the training, and scouting became very popular in the regiment. He introduced the then-revolutionary idea of awarding a badge for proficiency. He called this sketch Badge Vanity. During a vacation in Kashmir in 1899, I wrote a little book called Aids to Scouting for Soldiers. It taught them observation, or how to track, and it taught them deduction, or how to read the information given by the tracks. But the proofs of the book were not corrected in India, they were posted from a small town in South Africa, Mafeking, where BP had been sent to take command of the garrison at the start of the Boer War in 1899. Mafeking is a small market town on the railway. We had just a thousand hastily trained troops and 300 townsmen armed as a town guard and about 600 white women and children. The town was surrounded by 9,000 Boers. But we had to pretend to be very strong and dangerous force. The whole thing was, and had to be, a game of bluff from start to finish. One bit of bluff was a megaphone we manufactured. In order to give the enemy no rest at night, through the megaphone, an officer would adjure his men to come on quietly. Sergeant Jones, take command of the left-hand lot. Have you all got your bayonets fixed? No firing, mind. Now come on, very quietly. And so on, till volleys of musketry told us that the enemy were thoroughly awake and so nervous that their reserves had to stand too. And all the time, our men were comfortably sleeping. A night attack would probably have been successful. To discourage this, we started searchlights. Again, a bluff. We only had one, made out of a biscuit tin with a strong acetylene lamp inside it. But that one lamp did yeoman duty. No sooner had it done a display in one fort than it was rushed off to a different one. And thus, we spread an impression that any night attack would be exposed to a perfect blaze of searchlights everywhere. This gun, now in the Royal United Service Museum, was made at Mafeking. We took the steam pipe of an engine, and this was reinforced with some iron railings, melted down and shrunk onto it. And the whole contraption was mounted on the wheels of an old thrashing machine. My name among the natives was Impisa, the wolf meaning the beast that doesn't sleep at night. So this gun was christened the wolf, because it was chiefly to be used at night. This sketch made during the siege typifies baden Powell's sense of humour. Under it, he wrote, It isn't so much the shells that I object to, it's this everlasting standing on one's head while mother does the washing. It was here that he first became interested in training boys. My chief staff officer, Lord Edward Cecil, got together the boys in the place and made them into a cadet corps for carrying orders and messages and acting as orderlies and so on in place of the soldiers who were thus released to go and strengthen the firing line. 
We then made the discovery that boys, when trusted and relied upon, were just as capable as men and just as reliable. This is one of the Boer guns. In spite of their superior numbers and armament, they could not take the town, which had been under siege for 217 days by the time the relief force arrived. In 1900, BP was promoted Major General and given the task of raising and training the South African constabulary. This painting shows the uniform he designed for this force. In 1903, at the age of 46, he was made Inspector General of Cavalry, the highest command in his own branch of the army. Back in England, he found that his book, Aids to Scouting, was being used to train boys. His interest in youth was further roused when he inspected a rally of 7,000 members of the Boys' Brigade. After the rally, Sir William Smith, the founder of the Boys' Brigade, spoke to him. Could you rewrite Aids to Scouting? he asked, so that it would appeal to boys instead of to soldiers and make them into real men and good citizens. So I did that. But before writing the book, I planned out the idea and then tested it. It was on Brownsea Island off the Dorset coast in 1907 that... I got together some 20 boys of all sorts, some from Eton and Harrow, some from the east end of London, some country lads and some shop boys, and I mixed them up like plums in a pudding to live together in camp. I wanted to see how far the idea would interest the different kinds of lads. I had Major McLaren and Sir Percy Everett to help me, and we taught the boys camping, cooking, observation, deduction, woodcraft, chivalry, boatmanship, life-saving, health, patriotism, and all such things. He roused the boys every morning with the kudu horn. The camp lasted 12 days and... The results upon those boys in that short space of time taught me the possibilities which the scout training held for boys. So I at once set to work and wrote the handbook Scouting for Boys. The book came out in fortnightly parts at fourpence a copy. Before many of the parts had been published, I began to get letters from boys who had taken up the game for themselves. Boys not belonging to the Boys Brigade or other associations. And all through the following year, boys were writing to me, telling me how they had started their patrols and troops and then had got men to come and act as their scoutmasters. Scouting just started itself. In 1909, General baden Powell was knighted for his military services, but so many boys were taking up scouting of their own accord that in 1910, he resigned from the army to devote all his time to this new movement. Soon, he was inspecting rallies all over the country. This first movie picture of him was taken at Preston in 1911. Girls wanted the same kind of fun as their brothers, so the girl guides had been started in the previous year. in 1911, King George V reviewed 26,000 scouts at Windsor. Right from the start, the royal family realized the importance of this new movement, which had already spread to many other countries. In 1912, Sir Robert baden Powell set off on the first of his many world tours to see scouts and guides of all lands.
On this tour, he met Miss Olive Sinclair Soames. They were married in the same year, 1912. This car was a wedding present from the Scouts, who paid for it by a penny subscription. Lady baden Powell not only restrained BP's natural tendency to overwork himself, she also helped him greatly with his ever-growing task. Here she is with him at Leeds in 1914. At the outbreak of the First World War, many people thought that the Scouts would come to an end. But the movement didn't die. The boys were put on their mettle to carry on and do service for their country in the time of its need. They helped with the flax harvest. They sent six ambulances to the front and provided four recreation huts. And they took over coast watching duties, thus releasing coast guards for more active service. BP offered to rejoin the army, but he was told to continue organizing the invaluable work of the Boy Scouts. The first important event after the war was the opening in 1919 of Gilwell Park as a permanent camping and training ground for Scouters. With BP is the Duke of Connaught, a lifelong friend who was president of the Boy Scouts for 30 years. BP handed over the Kudu horn to Gilwell. At Olympia, London in 1920, the first World Jamboree was held. It was attended by scouts from many parts of the Commonwealth and from 21 other countries as well. The overseas contingents were inspected by King George V outside Buckingham Palace. At this Jamboree, Sir Robert baden Powell was proclaimed Chief Scout of the World. The boys carried him shoulder high across the arena as wave after wave of cheering brought the Jamboree to a close. Also at this jamboree were Heather and Peter, two of BP's children. In Denmark, four years later, the Second World Jamboree was held, attended by scouts from 33 nations. BP accompanied the King of Denmark as he inspected the boys. The chief scout had already built up a reputation for bringing rain with him wherever he went, and this occasion was no exception. Year by year, the movement continued to grow, and BP gave himself little time for rest. He went to innumerable rallies, like this one in Cardiff in 1927, and attended many meetings and conferences, both in this country and many parts of the world. In 1928, at his home at Pax Hill in Surrey, the Chief Scout held a reunion of the Brownsea Island campus, the first members of a movement which was by now worldwide and two million strong. The following year, more than 50,000 of these boys attended the coming of age jamboree at Birkenhead. Once again, the kudu horn was sounded, this time to open the jamboree. With the chief scout is the Prince of Wales, who stayed a night at the camp. At this rally, it was announced that King George V had raised BP to the peerage. Then the prince spoke to the boys. I have, first of all, to read to you, <coughs> to you a message from His Majesty the King, who I have the honor of representing here this afternoon. I heartily welcome the Boy Scouts who have traveled from their homes far distant in the British Empire and in many foreign lands for the coming of age of the Boy Scout movement. This is a unique assemblage representative of the youth of all the great nations of the world. And I ask them to remember that it is chiefly upon the coming generations that the future peace of the world depends. And may I have this opportunity of congratulating you, Chief Scout, on the honor that has been conferred on you by His Majesty the King.
BP took the title of Lord Basin-Pole of Gilwell. And here he is at Gilwell soon after the Jamboree. In that same year, he was made a Freeman of the City of London. An honour, he said, which I much appreciate because I'm a Cockney born and bred. Now in his 73rd year, he continued to attend meetings and rallies in England and all over the world. Here he is at a London rally in 1930. You've come from long distances to meet me. I'm very grateful to you for it. I'm so grateful that I haven't turned on the rain as usual. I've kept it fine for you. But I thank you very much indeed for coming. Best of luck to you. Good camping to you all. This portrait, which hangs in Girl Guide headquarters, was painted in 1930. During his life, he wrote 34 books, all of them illustrated with his own sketches. He could write or sketch equally well with either hand, and sometimes would write with his left hand while sketching with his right. In 1931, Lord and Lady Baden-Powell set off on another world tour. In New Zealand, they looked at the statue of Scott, the Antarctic explorer. From New Zealand, they went on to Australia, to a jamboree in Sydney. And now I would ask you to listen to your promise and think it over as you've never thought before. You promise, on my honor, your honor, mind you, to do my best, to do my duty to God and to the King, and to obey the Scout law. Will you do your best? Answer me. Wherever he went, in Australia or elsewhere, he was greeted with tremendous enthusiasm and with an affection that amounted to hero worship. And yet it never had any visible effect on him. The youngest scout or guide could feel at ease in his presence. Later, he went to Jembrook training camp in Victoria and planted an oak tree. Before leaving Australia, he had this to say. I've heard since I came to Sydney, there are some people still talk of our being a military movement. Well, that's all humbug, because we've now spread to 45 different countries about the world. It's a movement of absolutely of peace and goodwill among men. And all the different countries have taken it up in that spirit and I suppose that amongst our three millions of Boy Scouts and Girl Guides, there's not one who doesn't feel the bond of friendship and comradeship and brotherhood with those of other countries. And so we're growing into a great peace movement to back up the treaties and leagues of nations that are being made for the peace of the world. Back in England in 1932, he was present at a jamboree in the West Country. I want to thank you very much for the very warm reception you've given me here today. But I think better than all that is the fact that I have heard very good reports of what you're trying to do to help other people in these bad times. The fourth World Jamboree was held in Hungary in 1933 attended by scouts from 48 countries. BP was on horseback for the parade. 
the symbol of the jamboree was the white stag of Hungary. And it represented, said BP, the pure spirit of scouting, ever leading you forward and upwards and leaping over difficulties in the active pursuit of the higher aims of scouting. This family group was taken on board ship during a tour of Scandinavia later in 1933. Heather, Peter, and Betty. In 1934, the chief scout set out again on an extensive world tour, a formidable undertaking for a man of 77. But I'm going to British soil down below there, the other side of the world. And I want to carry your good wishes to your brother scouts over there. Because they're just the same as you. When we get there, I shan't be able to tell them from you fellows. They're just as ugly and, <laughs> and just as jolly and loyal to their country. So I'm sure you'll be glad if I give a message of good luck to them and goodwill from you all here. I do thank you very much for turning out today. Now I'm going to go on board and get some food. This tour ended in Canada, where the chief had a brief holiday. Fishing was his favorite relaxation, and he preferred to do it completely alone. Here he sketched himself being towed downstream by a salmon. Stockholm in 1935 was the scene of the World Rover Moot, which BP felt he must attend to encourage these young men of many nations in their efforts to make the Brotherhood of Scouts something more than a mere name. Although he was perhaps not quite so vigorous as these young men, the chief scout at his home in Surrey at the age of 79 still did his daily exercises. The occasion for BP in 1936 was the wedding of his youngest daughter, Betty, to Jervis Clay. In 1937, Lord Baden-Powell returned to India once again for the first All India Jamboree, an event of great significance because it meant that the scout ideal of brotherhood had triumphed over differences of race, religion, and caste. The chief scout was highly delighted with this demonstration of unity within the Indian movement. On his return to England, he spoke to the boys waiting for him on the quay side. But I'm very glad indeed to see you and I thank you for turning out. I ought to be in scout kit, but Lordy, they've gone and dressed me up like this to keep me warm. At Windsor Castle in April 1937, he was present for the annual St. George's Day service for scouts. After the service, the royal family chatted to the scouts, and BP talked to the present queen. In May, he attended the coronation of King George VI, who conferred on him the Order of Merit. He reached his 80th birthday in 1937. Here is part of a recording he made to mark the occasion. My dear brother scouts, I am 80 years old. What do you think of that? but I can't say that I feel very much older than some of you. I want you to have as long and jolly a life as I've had, and you can get it if you keep yourself healthy and helpful to others. You find that by making others happy, you're making yourself all the happier too. I'll tell you my secret. I've always tried to carry out the scout promise and the scout law in all that I do. If you do that, you will make a success of your life and will have a very happy time. 
even if you live to be 80, like me. The fifth World Jamboree in Holland in 1937, attended by scouts from 31 countries, was the last great occasion of BP's long life. With him is Queen Wilhelmina. Everybody at the Jamboree realized that the sands of his life were running out. His final, now goodbye, God bless you all, was charged with a deep affection that was felt throughout the vast assembly. Age was beginning to take its toll, and in the autumn of 1938, he left England for the more congenial climate of Kenya. In Kenya, he spent some time at treetops, the hut built on top of a tree for observing wild game. These pictures were taken with his own cine camera. He looked for rhino spore and tried the rhino escape ladder up the side of a tree. Even at his great age, he still occasionally rode a horse. But most of the time during his last few years, he lived quietly at his new home at Neary, which he called Pax II, after his old home Pax Hill in England. Here, he's playing with one of his grandchildren. Towards the end, he said, I'm content to leave the great game of scouting in the hands of the young, the keen, and the energetic. To them I say, God bless you and prosper your efforts. Lord Robert baden Pearl of Gilwell died peacefully at Pax II on the 8th of January, 1941. He was fittingly escorted by soldiers and scouts, both white and black, on his last journey. His body lies at Neri in the shadow of Mount Kenya. BP has gone home, but his spirit lives on in the hearts of the millions of boys and girls of all races who belong to the great movement he founded. Now let us listen to the message he gave on world scouting in 1934. Leagues and disarmaments and treaties and promises are all very well in their way between politicians, but they cannot produce peace unless the people themselves really want it. And that's what we're after, to try and breed in the next oncoming generation that spirit of friendship, comradeship, and goodwill, which is the true foundation for peace in the world. That message is as true today as when it was first spoken over 20 years ago. Let us all remember it and try to live up to the ideals it expresses. For there could be no more fitting memorial than this to Robert baden Pearl, Chief Scout of the World. I wish you a long and happy life and lots of good camping. Goodbye. <laughs>